Hello everyone and welcome back to Sunday Vibes. Welcome aboard on this Sunday morning. I've got Mikey and Belinda is back. Welcome back, Belinda. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I've enjoyed sort of international break. Men's football slowed down a little mm-hmm. bit. Of course, WSL was still kicking, but uh, yeah, ready for the Premier League to be back. Yeah, you guys have got Brighton at two. Yeah, yeah. How are you feeling? <sighs> They're a bogey team for Liverpool, but... We're, we're in the home straight now, so it's time to just pick up wins. <laughs> it's huge now. I mean, Mikey, there's a few weeks in front of us. Champions League restarting, Europa League obviously continuing. Huge games in the, in the Premier League as well. It's the business end of the season. Yeah, massive, massive. And, it, and obviously we, we spoke about, the well, two weeks ago we spoke about the title race, didn't we? And um, yeah, it is, you know, it's shaping up to be the best title, maybe the best title race in Premier League history, like it could be. Um, if, if both, you know, if, if all these three teams keep it up the draw for the quarterfinals of the Champions League I thought was great yeah. like after I thought the last 16 draw was, wasn't amazing but the, the quarterfinals I think will, will really live up to it um, and yeah like you said like even the Europa League is like the quality left in that competition is is massive as well and the way that that draws opened up you know with Liverpool and Leverkusen on, you know got got a route to the final there um, so yeah no I'm really I'm really really excited and for yeah especially for Arsenal Liverpool today although as we're filming this, I'm Arsenal still... Arsenal City. Arsenal City, sorry. Um, as we're filming this, I've got a family uh, kind of Easter lunch mm, thing in it's pretty the guessed. middle of the countryside. And I don't know what my possibility is about watching the game. So I need to... I need have to, to go I on the wireless. Old uh, school. Uh, oh, yeah, that's true, actually. I think radio on the way home might be the way, actually. Teletext. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, teletext. That, that will almost certainly be available um, where I'm, I'm going to be as we're recording. Then you joke, so, but yeah. when I was a youngster, that's what we used. Yeah, that, that I'm only joking. That I'm only joking. Yeah. <laughs> I think... When was teletext? Early 90s? Late, 2000s. Late Noughties, I, I, yeah. Noughties. I, I was, I, really? I mean, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was still around then. I mean, it was around forever, but... I remember, um, yeah, I remember I used to keep up to date in like kind of, yeah, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, I mm. was keeping up to date with scores on Teletext Store Fair or enough. CFAX as C-Fax. the BBC one, the BBC one is, um, which Fair is the one enough. I used. Um, so, so yeah, I think, they, I think they only actually got rid of it properly maybe three or four years ago. I think it was still being used on televisions and then... Yeah. There we have it. Bring oh, it yeah. back. Bring it back. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, let's get into today's show. We've got quite a big one, actually. Similarly to, I think it was last week or the week before, we are talking about teams that have been a little bit more disappointing and we are ranking their most disappointing players this season. We've got loads to get through. It's going to be a spicy one. <laughs> prepare to be annoyed. Prepare to be hopefully entertained and informed at the same time as well. So let's see how this goes. Let's start with Man United. Mike, it makes sense as the Man United fan. Why don't you kick us off with your most disappointing player for Man United this season? We do have to clarify that it's this Mm, season. This season, yeah. Uh, Obviously, with United, there are a number of players who've had disappointing seasons. Um, And I think, look, I think, you know, you can look at, you know, in terms of players who've been bought for a lot of money over the last few years and have underperformed um, on the defensive side of things, you know, like I think Rafa Varane has not had a great season by his standards. Um, obviously, you know, injured for a long time last year, but um, He's just but been you slightly have overwhel- uh, underwhelming ever since he joined Man United. I think. I think it's. I think his first season, he was he was he went quite underappreciated, but <clears throat> but again, like injury problems meant that he never really got a a good run in the side um so yeah this season not great Casemiro this season has struggled again you know big injury kind of you know towards the start of the season and hasn't really you know looked his old self since then his disciplinary record ever since coming to United has been a bit of an issue um so yeah though I guess you that those are two to shout out in that sense but really it's in the attack that United have underperformed mm. um I don't think really you can fault United's defence that much this season given how how much the attacks underperformed I mean United's defensive record is better than Spurs it's better than Villas it's better you know it's better than anyone in the top half or anyone in the Premier League aside from the the three title challengers um so in that sense yeah like defensively United could have definitely been better but I think you know the performances of Onana since October the performances mm. of Dallo all, all season um, you know even Maguire's improved form at points this term has you know has kept that defence uh, lo- locked down a little bit more um, even you know the introduction of Kobi Mainu 
in kind of January, February time and him and Casemiro generally being relatively solid as a pairing um, has helped with that as well. Uh, but I digress. Basically, yeah, looking at the attack, I think there are three options here. Ooh. You've got Marcus Rashford, who has underperformed the season. I think you've got Bruno Fernandes, who I think has probably had his poorest season in a United shirt. Um, but even then, for Bruno, he is still United's most productive player in the final mm -hmm. third. So I, could, I, I was very tempted by Bruno. I was really, really tempted by Bruno. But, creating a lot of chances too. But that's the thing. He's still creating a lot of chances. He's at 0.57 XG uh, expected goals and assists per 90, which is his worst record in the United shirt and yet it's still the best in the squad by a fair distance. I think Garnacho is fairly near to him but aside from that he's kind of out there on his own. Um, Rashford obviously having a poor season but I do think his form has picked up in the last couple of months Definitely. and Rashford having a poor season is not that is not that much of an anomaly in his United career. Like mm. he, he's only really had one very good season since 1920. So basically, since that back injury, he's only had one actually very good season. Last year, um, last year. Um, aside from that, it has been it has been a, a struggle for him over the last four years. Um, so I've got to go for Anthony. I've got to go for Anthony. United's second m most expensive signing of all time after Paul Pogba. He's played, you know, he hasn't been in the side that much this season, but I think that is telling in terms of the fact that United have had problems going forward and yet Ten Hag has not trusted him, even though he was one of his most trusted members of the squad last season. Um, so he's played almost a thousand Premier League minutes still and still yet to register a goal involvement in the Premier League. Um, he also failed to register a goal involvement in the Champions League. He's got those two goals in the FA Cup, one of which was against... Newport County and of course scored a very important you know equaliser against Liverpool didn't he but that really is his one moment of the season I can't really think of another one um, like you know hasn't had any significant injuries but only been given 10, 11 starts since the first four games of the season he's only lasted longer than 80 minutes on the pitch once in the league Wow. Um, so even when he is starting he's often being taken off for tactical reasons well before full time um yeah i just i think I, and and i think the price does come into it i think mm -hmm. this is a this is a player who at the moment looks like you know someone who who, who united have yeah wasted a lot of money on you know think about you know the money that united spent on sancho in 2021 and then anthony in 2022 to try and fix the right wing problem and they still haven't well fixed it properly i mean garnacho is kind of fixing it at the moment but um that wasn't really in the script um mm. like it's just yeah that the the amount of value that this player has lost mm. at united is massive and you know not only is that a headache has that been a headache for ten Hag this season in terms of like how you know trying to make this attack tick um it's also you know causing a massive headache for the new structure at Man United in terms of like what they're going to be able to do in the transfer market because that that outlay on Anthony was so significant. Um, so yeah, I've, I found it really really hard to look past him. Fair enough. I mean, you make a very convincing case, but before we sort of come to an ultimate agreement, maybe Belinda, who who was your suggestion? Yes, yeah, so I actually had a few names for United written down as well, and Anthony again is one of them. Mm. Uh, again, like you said, just because of the output and the the amount of money you spent on him, it, it's so easy to to pick him out again. Like you speak to my United fans as well, and nobody, there's mm. the general consensus is nobody is happy with yeah, him. Yeah, and I think I think the thing is that the difference between this season and last season was last season at least. I mean, it was his first season, and even when he wasn't necessarily scoring or assisting Anthony, there was at least a sense that he was bringing some sort of balance to the attack. Mm. There was like he was offering something. He's quite he, good in the Europa League, I seem to he remember. Was, well, he scored well. the winning goal against Barcelona. Yeah. Like, it, yeah, he he did bring something uh, to the table a bit more last year, and there was a sense that he kind of, you know. There was a reason why he was in the team, yeah. whereas this season, I mean, he, he barely makes the team. Um, and when he is on the pitch, yeah, it, it's very rare to, you know, to see him really produce in the final third at all. Yeah. Even if, yeah. It's funny because I actually went back and, and watched your guys' video a year ago. You did. Oh, wow. The season. It was, I think it was Zach, Pat and yourself. And you came to the conclusion then that Anthony was the biggest yeah. flop of the season. Really? But Some the, things the, never change. Yeah, well, the <laughs> caveat you made, though, was oh, I, you know, but next year he can kick on. He's yeah. had this bad year, but next year he'll kick on and he just hasn't done that. So it's just been another failure. But I also yeah. had Mount written down mm -hmm. okay. and literally just as simple as spending 55 million, I think it potentially rising to 60 million yeah. 
on a midfielder who would have come into your attacking midfield, like you said, he had issues with your attack and him just only playing eight games a season. It's not entirely his fault, obviously, because of yeah, injury. Injuries, yeah. But I think it's like one of them where the fanfare around the whole transfer and the way the transfer came about, because I, I guess it was sort of a contract dispute at Chelsea and he, so he ended up leaving his boyhood club because they wouldn't pay him maybe what he felt he deserved and then go into a big six rival. That's a big move, a big statement as well. And uh, unfortunately for him, you know, he ha- it hasn't happened this season. And we're going into the Euros now where he was in that debate of who is he the third midfielder yeah. and Nowhere near going it, into now, yeah, I don't even know if he might be on the plane at this rate. So definitely not. Yeah, uh, definitely I, had, not. I had Mount done for that one. Yeah, fair yeah. dues, fair <coughs> dues. I mean, it's crazy to consider that you know, there was a bit of a fight for his signature as well. I mean, mm. Arsenal were linked with him. Liverpool were yeah. obviously very yeah. strongly linked with him as well. I feel a little bit sorry for him with his body. I actually went for biggest disappointment. I actually think it's Rashford because I didn't. I just didn't really have that much hope about Anthony. Uh, mm. Although it sounds like I did a little bit more a year ago. But I feel <laughs> like that, that ship has just long sailed now. And Rashford is, if not the star, he's one of the top two stars in that team alongside Bruno. And he was excellent last year. 30 goals, was named you know, United's Player of the Year, was named Premier League Fans Player of the Year as well, which is quite a st- specific That's award. Mad. But anyway, yeah. it shows that he was really in that conversation. But this year, eight goals and six assists in 35 league games. And actually, you look at that, and I actually thought it, it could have been worse. Wait, is that, that's all competitions, I'm that's, Sorry, that's all, competi- yeah. that's all competitions. And I actually thought that could have been worse. But mm. as Mikey correctly points out, I think it's five goals in his last nine league games has really sort of boosted those numbers a little mm. bit because up until sort of February, late January time, it was really looking like a, a really forgettable year. Look, it's still not been great. I still think he'll probably make the plane to the to the Euros, given the fact that Raheem Sterling's playing so poorly, given the fact that Jack Grealish is injured and playing quite poorly when he's available as well. There is just less competition there. We know what you can do in major tournaments as well. He was excellent for England at the World Cup. But he is just my biggest disappointment for Man United. I don't even know if he. Does, like, I, I think there is. I think his place is under threat. Like you look at, yeah, you know, the fact that you know Gordon, Jared Bowen, Gordon were really all, well, were so. all getting like you know minutes over him in the two friendlies that we've just seen. And obviously, you can't read too much into those friendlies, but it's clearly an indication that Southgate is looking beyond the kind of trusted guard in those positions. You know, Madison as well. You know. You, you've got to make you, you potentially get Southgate's got to make space for both Cole Palmer and James Madison mm-hmm. and you would find it hard to argue against taking either of them given their form this season I know Madison obviously has had his injury issues but when he has played he's been superb so I don't know I think I think Rashford's spot could be un- even if Sterling doesn't go like before these friendlies I did think you know Rashford will it will be Rashford or Sterling who goes. Now I, I'm less sure whether either of them will go necessarily. That 23 given, man squad biting. Yeah, it, it, well, it is. Yeah, first of all, it's a 23 man squad. And, you know, yeah, Anthony Gordon like just gave such a good account of himself um, against Brazil. Madison, obviously, instrumental um, in the in the Bellingham goal, wasn't he, against Belgium. So I don't know. I, I think it, it could be worrying for Rashford. Um, I think, you know, some heroics in the last couple of months, maybe in the FA Cup, could could cement his place but I do, I do think that spot is under threat let's see let's see what he yeah. can deliver against the mighty Coventry who did put in that magnificent performance against Wolves in the previous round uh, right let's move on yeah. to Newcastle why don't we just let leave it up to you guys to decide actually so from those three selections for Man United who do you think was most disappointing uh, let's move on to Newcastle Belinda who did you have down for Newcastle Tonali mm. yeah uh, just again another one 55 million it's not astronomical fees you know relative to the transfers nowadays but it's still for a Newcastle nice though what's it I think it's yeah. second after uh, Isaac I think, I think mm. so yeah second yeah top signing um, again a lot of hype and a lot of expectation around him reaching Champions League semi-finals also I think was pretty instrumental in their their league winning season in 21 22 mm-hmm. so he would have been only been 2021 himself as well that season um, and so yeah a lot of a lot of expectation on him and I think you saw in the first few performances for Newcastle that he had it mm-hmm. technical ability was there but even physical ability was there as well to compete in the league uh and then to yeah get a, a 10 month ban missing the whole rest of the season missing the euros missing even the start of next season I think that's just a bit of a flop and I don't know the ins and outs of it but potentially you know is there a, a case where Newcastle didn't do their full due diligence there in that transfer but yeah, for now, it feels like a massive uh, a blow to lose him for 10 months out of, I think it's a five-year deal that you might sign, so mm. yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate, isn't it? I mean, they're two big signings from last summer. Barnes has been injured and mm. Tonali's now been banned. I mean, obviously, 
really hope he gets the help he needs because it does sound like he has got some of sort course. of some form of addiction um, yeah. or at least you know if not a full addiction he's definitely got a, a big big problem there for Newcastle I talked about Dan Byrne um, a few weeks ago on the show I think that was a mistake in not upgrading him at left back you know I wrote down as well that you could potentially look at someone like Sven Botman as well but instead I'm actually going to go for Miguel Almiron which feels Ooh. a bit brutal because <laughs> he is just known for that ridiculous run of form last year yeah. Um, I think it was between October, middle of October to Boxing Day. Uh, yeah, he was on an incredible run of form. I think it was eight goals in nine games. Uh, but since then, just five in, 50, in 46, I think it is. Prior to that, it was 10 in 107. So it was just like that one stint just really connected. And he scored those amazing goals. I always remember that one against Brentford in particular was, was an absolute stunner. Uh, and at a time when we've talked about Barnes being out we've talked about Callum Wilson getting injured you know Newcastle needed Almiron to to really deliver this year and he hasn't done I think he's been really really disappointing uh, not just in terms of his numbers but in terms of his performance levels and the Newcastle side that have completely gone off the boil um, in the last few months and a lot of that is tied down to injuries but they needed their more experienced players to step up they needed someone that did look like one of their players of the year last year and that was mainly due to that one patch of form but still he's he's an experienced Premier League player now um, and yeah, they needed more from him. So I'm going with Miguel Almiron, which feels a bit harsh because I do like him as a player. I like his story, but it's just not been good enough. Yeah, I kind of feel with Almiron, he's probably reverted to the mean a little bit more mm. or the rest of the average. Like I think he did. But once over, you've shown yourself did, to be a he superstar, did, man. he did overperform last year. Um, so I don't know. I was considering him as well. Uh, it, feel, it just feels a little harsh because I just think even despite last year's performances, the right wing should have still been an area where Newcastle should have upgraded. Um, you know, like hindsight's a wonderful thing, but maybe they don't spend the money on Barnes and instead they sign someone who can play on, on the, the right. right. Or I know, can cover on the I know, right. I know DRB was like in their sights as well, but, and Barnes on the face of it, a really good signing. You know, he scored on his debut, but like. But he does play the same position as Anthony Gordon. Like, I don't yeah. really get the thought. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think the thought might have been that they didn't think that they, they maybe didn't think that Andy Gordon was as ready as he was, and turns out he was super, super ready. But again, it you know it goes back to the Tonali thing, like you're saying, Belinda. Like, did did Newcastle, you know, what like could there have been a an opportunity for Newcastle to to, um, you know, I, I mean, even despite everything away from the pitch with Tonali, like, is is was Tonali actually the best profile of midfielder for yeah. Newcastle no. to go for? Yeah. I don't know necessarily. Like, they I'm needed not the sure. more creative midfielder. Yeah. I said it at the time. I feel like James Madison would have been absolutely perfect yeah. for Newcastle. And yeah, he could play on the right as well. Can play on the right. Can cover in both wing positions. And and it's proved himself at Spurs to just be so ready for for this level. And it's already one of the. I think he was Player of the Year pretty much, or at least the top candidate before he got injured in like November time. Um, so that, I feel like that was a missed opportunity. But Mikey, sorry, I've cut you off. Who did no, you no, want no, to not suggest? at all, not at all. I, I think it's um, it's good to to look at the, the the bigger picture here because I think it all kind of ties in, especially with Newcastle. Like, so speak up, Miguel Almiron. Like, one of the things, even when he's not scoring or assisting, that you know ha, has has meant that he's you know still very much trusted by Eddie Howe is his defensive work mm. rate. But Newcastle defensively have dropped off a cliff this year, mm. like, absolutely <laughs> dropped off a cliff. Um, because yeah, like I mean, their attacking play great um you know last year but really it was their defense that set them apart you know they had the second best expected goals against after man city they only conceded 33 in the league last year which was level with city this season they've already conceded 48 goals and that's basically around the level that they should have done according to expected goals against i think they rank sixth bottom um in terms of their defensive record in that sense um you know in you know three of those you, 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 the, the ones below them are the likes of Sheffield United, the likes of Burnley, Nottingham Forest. Um, so yeah, really, really poor at the back this year. And again, it feels a bit harsh because he, you know, he had to return from a quite a serious knee injury. He's now ruled out for another night, potentially up to nine months after knee surgery. But Sven Botman, given just how much of a star he was last year, you know. He really did make a, a huge difference in that back line last year after they signed him. Um, you know, he, he hasn't looked like the same player, or he didn't look like the same player after coming back from that knee injury. Um, you know, in the 10 games that he started after coming back from that injury, six of those starts 
um, ended up with Newcastle conceding three plus in those games. And they were some of them were tough games. You know, they, they, there was that game against Liverpool, which to be fair, tough game, but seven xG conceded in that game. Obviously, a Premier League record. Like that's not just good. not good enough, <laughs> man. And again, it, you can't just put that all in one defender, but. City and Arsenal as well, they conceded three plus against, but then they also conceded three against Forest, they conceded four against Luton. Um, and yeah, there are there are mitigating factors here, right? Like, first of all, you know, Dubravka in goal, I actually think he's done an, a fairly admirable job in Nick Pope's absence. Um, I think actually he's his save rate in terms of like goals that he should be or shouldn't be saving in his saving is actually slightly better than Pope's was in the first half of the season. Um, you know, like he, he's he's been absolutely fine as a shot stopper, but what he doesn't offer, which Nick Pope does, is that ability to sweep up at the back, the ability to actually leave his box and uh, and and take that pressure off defenders, take that pressure, um, you know, off Newcastle when they're in danger of a counter attack or whatever. Like he doesn't offer that, so there's that lack of protection behind the back line in that sense and then of course the injuries in midfield have been a huge factor as well you know Bruno G is the only midfielder to have played more than 20 games in the Premier League this season that's always going to have a detrimental effect so I do feel for Botman but I just had to pick someone and I just think in terms of a player who's had uh, the, I just feel like he's had the most significant drop off of, of, of any Newcastle player because he was so so excellent last year mm. um, you know his um yeah, his tackles and interceptions have have gone to the lowest of his career. Um, his tackle success is down uh, about 15%, I think, which is quite a significant drop-off as well. I think last year, I think he had the second best tackle success rate in the entire Premier League. So, yeah, that drop-off does worry me a little bit. And again, yeah, it feels harsh because, like, you know, hopefully, like, he'll, he'll come back from knee surgery and within time he will get back to the level that he was at and... Had he not had that injury this season, I feel like, you know, Newcastle defence and, and, and Botman would have, um, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation so much. But, um, but yeah, unfortunately, I had to pick someone and that just felt like the, the first to pick. I considered him too. I considered yeah. him too. Fine. Let's move on from Newcastle. Let's talk Chelsea. Mm. Belinda, where did you go with this one? Because obviously difficult season again. Mm -hmm. Maybe a few candidates to, to think about. Who did you, who yeah, did you go for? You take your pick, to be fair. There's a few yeah. in there. Uh, yeah, I've written down sort of names like Lavia again, unfortunate with injuries, and Kunku, similar situation, but they were big money attached to those as well. So between them, that's that's probably like 100 plus million there, just just not not getting games this season because of injuries. But I've gone with uh, Reese James, actually. Ooh. Just because of, again... Shooting for the king. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, best not miss. Um, <laughs> no, when, when, yeah, go back to sort of start of the season, pre-season, he got made club captain... And just what a story that was to go from academy to captain of your boyhood club. Great story. Then had that first game against Liverpool and the comparisons with Trent were, were right there, or, you know, right in front of us for, for everyone to see. Uh, and you got a lot of applause, I think, that game as well. But you did a tweet after that game. I think I, think I wrote it down, actually. Uh, new era loading, PS, we're just getting started. He then went, got injured, <laughs> which is really unfortunate. Again, I, I, these, it's not his fault for being yeah. injured, but... It's also like I'm talking about flop. Someone who went in with high expectations and then it hasn't. I mean, he is. I think you're just basing this on the fact that he is when he's fully fit and on form, like one of the best right backs in the league. Yeah, in the, yeah. In the world. In the world, in the world, yeah. Um, and yeah, got injured and then he came back from this muscle injury and then got injured again and had to have surgery. And that's why I think like the probably the biggest disappointment has to come because what happens where you, you you're out with a muscle injury, you come back and then you need surgery. Like mm. again, I don't want to speak about how medical people work in, in football because I do not work in that field. I don't have the expertise to crit criticise them. But I do wonder, again, is there a bit of like, lack of player care there or something that's required him to have surgery? And again, I think he's yeah he's played less than 400 minutes in his first season as club captain in the league. So yeah. that's not great. And you know what? Probably the most dis difficult thing for him individually is Gusto's been all right mm. at right back. And they, maybe they've they've... The output isn't the same as what Reese James has got, but that that energy on the right hand side, that engine to just get Chelsea up the pitch or down that wing and get back and defend, he's got it. And he's so young, isn't he? That's the thing. He's, he's so 20. young, only twenty years he old, grew. so highly rated before he joined Chelsea. Like, obviously signed as really as depth, but yeah, that's the th I think that's the thing with Reese James is that like yeah, like he hasn't 
you know he hasn't been able to show himself because he's been because he's been injured so much but unlike in previous seasons where maybe he's missed significant time with injury but has been very effective when he's played this season it does feel like psychologically for Reese James probably the toughest like yeah. partly because he's yeah club captain like you say but also now that there, there, there just is this reputation with him mm. like I don't I like when Reese James's name gets mentioned now like in in most circles the the kind of the the initial reaction is well you know will we ever actually see mm. him like will we actually ever ever see him get anywhere near the potential that he's you know that he's got because there there seems to be like a, a, I guess like a lack of faith now that we'll ever see Reese James complete a full season fully fit um, and obviously he's still young but yeah. yeah it is it is a concern and yeah the fact that you know, like you say yeah, the fact that Malagusta is great now it's like well yeah even when he is fit like how how much how how quickly does he need to get back up to speed to actually regain his place in that side mm. yeah fair enough I think he's a uh, he's worth a mention for sure I mean I considered Robert Sanchez as well in goal yeah, mm. I did, he's been yeah. replaced by Jordi Petrovic that's a great shout actually yeah. I didn't think about Robert yeah. Sanchez but that's such I a mean I think they made a mistake there in not yeah. signing a really top goalkeeper I think most Chelsea fans would agree with that I think it feels a bit harsh but Axel de Sassi has not been mm. brilliant in his debut season but it is his debut season yeah. there's been a lot of chop and change around him he's played at right back of course as well but has been really injury prone as well but again I've got to go with most disappointing like I didn't have high hopes for Robert Sanchez in particular so I've got to go with Raheem Sterling you know in his second full season at Chelsea now and I just don't think it's a transfer that reflects very well on him at the moment either you know it is difficult he's onto his what fourth manager as mm -hmm. a Chelsea player was coming from the most incredibly well-oiled machine that would create so many opportunities for him that he'd stick away with regular you know ability you know he I think scored over 10 league goals for five seasons in a row for his final five seasons there three times scored over 17 once got 20 league goals in a campaign this was a scoring machine and this season having said that at the same time he did miss a number of opportunities during those years you know he's not the most clinical finishers he's not a Son Heung Min but he's very good at getting into scoring positions and often tucking them away this season I don't know whether it's just the players that have changed around him the sort of chemistry in that team has lacked at different points as well some of the decision making from Pochettino in terms of his makeup of his midfield I think has not helped him at all either but he's just it's not just the chances he's missed it's actually a bit of selfishness that I've seen at different opportunities mm. as well not squaring the ball when he should have in that Leicester game just before the break which is very fresh in my mind as well taking the ball off Palmer for a penalty missing it taking the ball off Palmer for a free kick missing it you know th these are big moments and he is the best paid player in that squad I think I think yep. he's on 325,000 pounds per week you know he's got another four you know he's got another three years on that contract so it'll be 32 by the end of it he's still only 29 which is absolutely wow. crazy. He's younger than I am, which blew my mind when I you know, <laughs> turned 30 this week. Raheem Sterling's a baby in comparison. He's got months before his 30th. But this is the time of his career where he's moved to Chelsea for this big fanfare, the marquee signing of that first summer, which does on reflection look like a terrible summer of business from Chelsea. Abemiang, Koulibaly, Sterling. I mean, oh. farmer has been unlucky with injury. Kukurea, not a good summer of business. But either way, he was the great hope. And he hasn't delivered on a consistent enough basis. I'm not saying he can't turn it around, but, you know, this was a guy who was, you know, a mainstay of the England side, but the big hope of this new Chelsea project. And at the moment, he's not doing either of them. Yeah, um, I think, it, yeah, I, I think I think the, the, the Sterling transfer to Chelsea in general has been been a big disappointment, hasn't it? Um, and again, another example of maybe... Uh, it, it did seem like, yeah it did seem like a, a very decent move at the time for the price but I just yeah it, do, it does make me think like did, was that, that that city system really really built for him mm. Mm. in that sense and I think he did have to change his game quite a lot in order for that to work he, he really did become like almost like a poacher at points in that city team but then for um, England he's never amazing. played really that well, role yeah, and he's been that guy yeah, that yeah. can drive from central areas and yeah. like plays a very different role and, and he, he's and he very good play, at it for England to be fair in 1819 when De Bruyne was injured for most of the season Sterling did take up a lot more responsibility in terms of ball carrying so like it's not like he's incapable of doing that um, and I was considering Sterling I was considering him yeah, but I, just, you go for? I do I just think with Sterling at least we there have been like two periods of the season where he's been playing excellently mm. like the start of the season he was brilliant and then yeah was it kind of yeah that, that time that you were talking about as well Dukes, um around November December um, yeah like I, I think Sterling at the moment 
you know his uh, his name is is you know he's a punch not, bag not really. very, yeah he's big, he's become a bit of a punch bag at Chelsea and yeah like that performance um, in the FA Cup was was really really poor but I do think there's slight short sightedness with that like I can absolutely see Sterling coming back and having a really positive end of season yeah. um, if if he keeps his, got the talent. If, if he keeps his place that is if he keeps his place in the side I'm not sure, so sure that he will and I was also considering Mudrick but then <laughs> just Mudrick's form recently has picked up as well but like generally speaking on the whole I think Mudrick has been like easily the most disappointing signing that Chelsea have made over the last two years um, like so such a lack of confidence in front of goal until very recently um but yeah his performances have picked up a lot Axel de Sassi was also down for me like I think he has struggled at points but then at the same time he is Pochettino's most trusted player he's played more minutes mm. than anyone else in that squad um and like you say Dukes has played on the right a little bit if I'm honest if I have to pick any Chelsea centre-back um who's who's really disappointed me this season it's Thiago Silva and that, and that's and that is harsh because he's you know nearly forty, but I think I think he has been Chelsea's most maybe the biggest drop off of any Chelsea player because he was so important for Chelsea you know ever since signing in twenty twenty you know probably the most consistent performer in the side. This year, I think Pochettino's system in particular has exposed him. Um, I just don't think he's got the legs for it anymore um, at least not in a, in, a, in a more high energy system under Pochettino you know I think Thomas Tuchel did a, an amazing job in terms of actually like playing a system that really got the best out of Thiago Silva so you know slower build up more conservative approach I think that's perfect for Thiago Silva's game I just don't think it's, it, he suits Pochettino sadly um, and he's one of the best centre backs of all time so um, yeah uh, I, I feel like he he stands out to me Badia Shield as well but hasn't had that much game time mm-hmm. I feel like it's a little bit harsh um, really the flop is not playing De Sassi and Badia Shield as a pair more often because I think mm-hmm. that I think I think there's a lot in that they've played together more than any other pairing in either of their careers um, when they did play together I think it was against Aston Villa in the FA Cup they looked really good um, so yeah I think that's that's a bit of a an oversight a bit of an oversight from Pochettino so far this season uh, anyway I've got for everyone but someone so I think who wins out really is Ben Chilwell for me yeah. I, think, oh, I right. think he I think he's been like I actually saw him I went I went to see Chelsea when they smashed Middlesbrough was it 6-0 in the in the semi-final yeah. of the, the EFL Cup and Chilwell was probably the best player on the pitch that night but it was against a very poor Middlesbrough side who yeah like, giving away goals it, like it, it, it was yeah. it was basically a training game in the second half so you couldn't take too much away from that otherwise yeah, he, he just the drop off has been big, and we saw it in the in you know in the international friendlies. He just does look like a bit of a shadow of his former self. Um, defensively, you know, ha- has has looked shaky. I think his passing has looked really really poor since the start of last season. He's only registered three assists in the league, which is you know g- given just how much of an attacking threat he can pose, and and especially like the the positions he can pick up in the box as well like he's not actually scored that much in that time either um and again it is you know it's partly down to injuries he's missed 90 games for club and country since november 2021 which is yeah wow. seriously um seriously worrying um so yeah i think chilwell just about takes it for me it was kind of a hit between him and tiago silva for me to be honest i, I think i think chilwell's another one who maybe struggles with the weight of the the captaincy because he's obviously vice yeah and he's so he's had it when rich james has been out and I think he saw it in the Carabao Cup final. It felt a little bit like he's just trying to overcompensate. Maybe because mm. of in the game they played against Liverpool at Anfield, he got a bit of stick for like not looking after the, the ma- mascot. Mm. Mascot. Sorry, I can never say that word. Um, and uh, again, I just, maybe it's just it's too early for him to to have that yeah. that leadership role in, in the dressing room, like that, especially one with Thiago Silva's in, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I think it's um, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because there's just so many young players such a young squad as we always say with Chelsea um, and so like even Reese James it was probably too early for yeah. him to have the captaincy yeah. um, it would have probably been Mount had he not had he not left yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah so yeah again it, it feels a little bit harsh maybe uh, in some ways maybe Thiago Silva would be my shout actually fair I'm, enough I'm, 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 I'm tempted to Chelsea fans mind. get at us right yeah. guys we've spoken for ages about three teams and we've got loads to get through yeah. so we need to up the pace well let's sure. talk Brentford yeah I considered Keen Lewis Potter Ooh. bit harsh but he did yeah. cost a lot of money from Hull City a couple of years ago 
Hasn't really done much. Has had his injury issues. But in the end, I went for Mark Flecken in yep. goal. I think it's quite obvious. Although he did play really well against Scotland the other day. He made an amazing save from Ryan Christie playing for the Netherlands. He's now been capped seven times by the Dutch. And But yeah, I mean, he was really solid at Freiburg for the last two seasons. He was actually there for five years and was a backup number two up until the final two years. But this year, I mean, he's at over six goals conceded more than expected goals. More than um, seven. Suggests. More than seven, yeah. sorry. Which I think is third in Europe uh, behind two goalkeepers, one of which uh, plays for Sassuolo and the other one for Torino, whose names escape me. But either yeah. way, third in Europe for most goals conceded versus expected goals. And, ball- and Brentford, sorry, I think it should be 10th by expected goals against. And instead, they have conceded, I think only Burnley and Sheffield United have conceded more than them. So that is really, really troubling. And if you have that discrepancy sort of solved in your goalkeeping issues Brentford would be more in mid-table where they would be whereas now they're kind of nervously looking over their shoulder if Nottingham Forest or Luton go on a run at any stage Brentford could really be drawn in and at a time when Tony's been out and missed so much of the season when they've had key injuries all across the park they really needed a solid campaign for their goalkeeper and yes he is new to the Premier League which I will give him some leeway on that but I just don't think it's been good enough so I'm going with Mark Flecken yeah, I have to agree, uh, Dukes. Um, I, it was hard to look at like at any individuals in this Brentford side and say that they've really like underperformed hugely. I think Lewis Potter, um, I think a little bit of a, a victim of having to play left wing back. I don't think that's his uh, good position for him at all. I think he is a I think he is a left winger. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to look past Flecken, especially given that you know Raya left for Arsenal last year. Raya. Uh, I think saved 5.1 more goals than he should have according to post shot XG. So that's a 12 goal swing, uh, which is huge. So consider that Brentford, yeah, have conceded 54 goals this season, which, like you say, is one of the worst records in the league. Um, you know, with in theory, with the same defensive performance as they've had this season last year, which was probably a bit better of a better defensive performance, but. That would be with Raya in goal. That would stand what at forty-two goals, which would be, you know, that would be Aston Villa and Tottenham level of 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 you know goals conceded this season. So it is really really significant in that sense. Um, and you know, stuff like shot, uh, shot, uh, not sorry, cross claiming as well. Like Flecken is clearly not as good as Raya. Raya is the best in the league at mm-hmm. claiming crosses. I think he claims something like 15% of the crosses that come into Arsenal's box, um, which is outrageous. Like actually, I think that might be, I think that is the best um, record in Europe. Um, but even compared to what he was doing at Brentford, like Flecken is a step down on that. Um, and yes, it like, again, the, the fact that he was assigned last summer as well, along with Kevin Sharder from Freiburg too, between them, they cost 38 million euros. Um, Freiburg laughing all the and, way to and, and, and once again, like Brentford, you know, they were so amazing at, at constantly making a profit on their way to the Premier League. But that's now three summers in a row in which Brentford have very uh, have very much been um, in the red when it comes to transfer spending. And, you know, the, the, they haven't, you, you know, they, they, it hasn't been that many hits compared to what they were getting in the championship you know and it is a different context and you know they are having to sign different profiles of players because of where they are in the premier league but um you know i I don't think brentford can have you know i I don't know if they can afford necessarily to have another summer like they did last year where they didn't really get much value for their money um and obviously yeah charlotte's been out yeah did I say? Did I say Sharda had been out yeah, since yeah. September? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm uh, yeah, I'm I'm just repeating myself here. But um, Nathan Collins, I think, absolutely fine signing. I think in the long term will be really, really good and has has shown really good signs this year. But um, even then, Brentford fans have you know not not loved him. So um, yeah, I think it, it. I think you know fine this year, but I think you know, um, and especially with you know a potential you know sale of the club from Matthew Benham as well, like. I think, yeah, there, there are reasons to be a bit concerned about Brentford in over the next couple of seasons. Um, yeah, they certainly can't afford to have another summer like last. Absolutely not. Flecken, both in agreement, right? Yeah. Belinda, you're staying loyal to the bees and you didn't want to criticise <laughs> anyone from Brentford. <laughs> so let's move on to Everton. It's a tough Who's, one, though. I think Flecken's the, uh, is, yeah. is the clear yeah, shout here. I mean, it wasn't very obvious as, you know, as, uh, as some other clubs. Uh, let's move on to Everton, though. Who's your suggestion for Everton? I've gone with Calvert-Lewin. Ooh. Yeah, same. 
Yeah, uh, obviously not entirely the players' fault as to why they're down where they are. I think they should technically be a few places higher. Um, but yeah, uh, three goals uh, this season in 12 games. And he's also m had 12 big chances missed in the league. That puts him in the top five for big chances missed with guys obviously like Haaland and Nunes who are mm. scoring a bit. Um, and yeah, that alone was, was enough to, for me to put him as a flop. He had a decent season last year as well. Um, well I think he did anyway. Mm. Um, Better than this one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> relatively. Um, but yeah, he's my guy. I think they signed Beto as well in the summer, I guess, to have some... They, they don't really have any star quality, a bit of X factor up front. And I think Calvert-Lewin is meant to be that. And so when he's not that, it, they, they just look so sort of blunt up yeah. top. And yeah, he's my shout. Those seasons where I think it was 13 league goals in 1920 and then 16 the year after. And he was he was Kane's understudy. Like yeah. People forget and yeah. like deservedly so. He was brilliant in that in that period. But you're right. It has been a, a steep, steep decline. And, and no one's underperformed their expected goals by more in Europe this season, which is pretty damn. Calvert Lewin. Calvert Lewin. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, like, they've only scored 29 league goals. I think only Sheffield United uh, have uh, can scored fewer. Sorry, I think that's level with Burnley as well. So they're right in. The relegation mix in terms of goals scored, as you say, the points deduction does put them mm. in, in more of a trouble than they would be, even though I still think they'll be absolutely fine. But Calvert-Lewin, it's been difficult. Obviously, injuries are such a huge factor. It does feel like you can't mention his name without saying injuries, but maybe he just needs a change of scene as yeah. well. Um, mm. it, it's just not working out for him. He's it feels like everything he's doing is just not coming off. It's just hard to see what what Who would sideways go step he takes. Um, it wasn't long before, long ago that Arsenal were looking at him. Yeah, but it's just like that. That's so. That's that's so. That's out a long of the time ago now, point, yeah. isn't it? Maybe a Fulham. I don't know. Um, Who did you go for, Mikey? I actually went for Beto. I went for did his you? his striking <laughs> rival, I guess, um, wow. who's only just come back into the team as a starter. Over like, Cavalin's only just been dropped in March. Um, yeah, I think Beto's been massively disappointing. I mean, you talk about Calvert-Lewin, like at least Calvert-Lewin is getting on the end of chances even if he's missing them, you know. I just think Beto, for the money that they paid in the summer, has been really, really disappointing. Um, he's only made five uh, Premier League starts. Um, two of those starts, I oh, know, sorry, until March, he'd only made five Premier League starts. He's now made seven. But two between September and March, he only made two starts in the league. Um, yeah, Calvert-Lewin, despite his poor scoring form, kept him out for a lot of that time. Um, two goals in the league. I just think given, again, like we, we talk about like, you know, PSR and stuff and Everton's points deductions. And while Beto's may not have directly contributed to the, their first round of points deductions, nevertheless, like a, a club in Everton's financial situation you know, if you spend the kind of money that you spend on a striker like Beto, who did have a great record with Udinese in Serie A, um, you know, hitting double figures in two seasons in a row, you need that to come off. Like, you really need that to come off. Um, otherwise, it's, you know, money down the drain and, you know, potential sanctions in the future as well. And it just hasn't happened for him. You know, Mikalenko and Branthwaite have scored as many goals as, as Beto in the league this season. Um, yeah, I, I can't, yeah, I just think, yeah, be massively disappointing in that sense. And I think, like, w I, I, I see the argument with Calvert-Lewin, but I think, you know, signing someone like Beto, I think, you know, was with the with, with thinking that, you know, Calvert-Lewin is... is less than reliable fitness wise and you do need someone mm. in that side to step up you know um you know Mopai wasn't able to do so last year and so it felt like Beto was you know a striker who would would be able to you know get up to speed with the Premier League quickly you know he certainly has the the I think the physicality and the goal to, to be able to do that um but in this Sean Dyche system it just doesn't look like it's worked at all we're going for the strikers, guys. Yeah. Better or Calvert-Lewin, let us know in the comments. Right, let's move on to Luton. Luton I found really, really difficult because they are obviously one of the stories of the season. You know, most people had them down as 20th. You know, they've got a really decent chance of staying up now. Uh, currently one point clear of relegation with nine games to go. A lot of star performers uh, and not least, not least Alfie Doughty. And I'm actually going to go for the player that it felt like Luton were signing to play in Alfie Doughty's mm. position, which was Ryan Giles who was brilliant last year on loan at Middlesbrough from Wolves, uh, played pretty much every single game, but was just, I think he started Luton's first three league games this year, but did very, very little in the minutes he played. And then I think he only played 250 minutes after that. Alfie Doughty emerged as one of their most 
crucial attacking weapons, to be honest, with that delivery from wide. Ryan Giles moved to uh, Millwall in January. Oh, sorry, Hull City in January. Um, and then his first game was against Millwall, and he's played every minute of every game since. So he's, he's, he's only 24. I don't mean to be too harsh. I'm sure he can come again in the Premier League, but at the moment he feels like he's championship level uh, or just not good enough to displace Alfie Doughty. And given the fact that they spent the most money they spent on one player last summer on Ryan Giles, I thought he was the, the way to go yeah. because most of their players have been pretty good. Uh, Belinda, who was yours? Yeah, I felt it was quite harsh to sort of pick on any of their players who got them promoted last year from the Championship and are playing now because, like, I think they're, like, sort of... They massively overachieved to even get the promotion. And so, like, yeah, to the way they've been competing in the league as well this year, it, 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 it can show, like, Ogbené got eight Championship goals last year, four Premier League goals this year. OK, that's, fi- that's a fine pretty, drop-off. Pretty fine, yeah. yeah. Uh, Morris, 20 Championship goals last year, eight Premier League goals this year. Again, I just don't think he's... I think he's a championship level striker, so that's that's eight yeah. Premier League goals, still fine. Adebayo is even better. He's seven championship goals last year, nine this year. That's fantastic. Loves it in the prem. Yeah. Um so the one the name that I've gone for that's I looked at their tra- transfers in off that logic. <laughs> I went for Townsend. Okay, yeah. Andros Townsend. I think it's a bit rogue. Like they didn't pay it was a free transfer. Um but one goal and three assists, and then they gave him a long term contract in January. Rob Edwards said one of the most impressive things that why they gave it was because of his fitness. But since then, he's not played more than like 66 minutes. He never, he's not completed a 90. I'm a bit confused. Mm. And like, I'm just hoping he's not on like a crazy wage. Because mm. like relative to Luton, I think like the strategy must have been like, come up, invest in the club and the infrastructure around it to, to be over Premier League level because like the facilities and stuff in the stadium weren't uh, adequate at the start of pre-season. So I think that was their plan, and then they thought if we go down, it's it's not like a failure. It, yeah. We can we can fight then in the championship and come back up potentially. So I'm just hoping, like relative to the money that they've got, they didn't waste a load of it on towns and um, and yeah, like what, what I think I said it. He got uh, one goal and three assists. What the fo- what goal was at the start of the season? And I, yeah, it just it's not a, it's not a brilliant return at the set. Yeah. I don't know. I found it really difficult with Luton because I don't think any of them have played too badly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he has shown a little bit of quality with some with some crucial assists from wide. He's in his thirties now. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't expecting too much, which is why I'm not so disappointed with him. Whereas Ryan Giles was one of the most talked about left backs yeah, in fair, in, yeah. in the champ. I don't know, my Cubs. Do you have a sort of deciding I, I voice? Did, I, I did go for Ryan Giles. Yeah. I did go for Ryan Giles, and it feels a bit cheating because you know the decision's already been made. They let him go for, uh, on loan in January, um, but yeah, it, it's disappointing. It just feels like a waste of resources. A, you know, a little bit like with with Townsend's um, you know long term deal. Like yeah, five million does look like a waste given that Doughty was was great in the championship last term. Like. And I can see why, like, like Grand Giles was was absolutely um, brilliant on loan at Middlesbrough, great on loan at Cardiff before that. Like, you know, it's it's tantalising that, and, and you know, clearly has the ability to make the step up to the Premier League. Um, but like, Rob Ebb was clearly did not fancy him um, up against Doughty, and like, it does show. Like, even you know, yeah, he's playing loads for Hull at the moment, but. His creative numbers have dropped off a cliff mm. even back in the championship. I think he's got like one goal for Hull, no, sorry, one assist for Hull so far. And I think he's still um, only pu- putting up something like 0.09 expected goals and assists per 90. Like compare that to like when he was at Cardiff, he was putting up almost 0.5. At Middlesbrough, he was at like 0.3, which are like, those are pretty outrageous numbers for like a left back slash wi- left wing back, like really outrageous numbers. But like that, that kind of drop off is... Is, is, is very very noticeable and in some ways it's you know it's not surprising that Luton decided to, to well not cut their losses because he's obviously only on the loan but um, I guess to cut their losses on him for, for this season at yep. least Fair enough Ryan Giles I think won there uh, let's move on to Nottingham Forest but Linda who's your suggestion for Nottingham Forest? To be fair I don't have an awful lot to say on this one either <laughs> well I've gone with the keeper Turner Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I really considered him Yeah. Again the transfer the forced out like you probably word it like that because obviously they brought um, Raya in so they've got one and two there so he had to leave to get to get games but yeah just the save percentage of six seven percent post shot xg of 22 bit error prone as well uh, I think I think the only thing he excelled at was actually sort of uh, claiming crosses I think his distribution wasn't awful but yeah I I yeah. can't really argue. I, mean, I think they've signed three goalkeepers in the last yeah. two windows it's, yeah. it's ridiculous they've wasted man. so much money I, I think I think the thing I think what the thing is with Matt Turner is that it's well he has had a bad season like, there's no doubt about it he has had a really poor season um, but it's almost like the fact that he like he almost 
encapsulates everything that's like ridiculous about Nottingham Forest. Like you were saying, Dukes, they've signed so many keepers. Um, but like Matt Turner himself, like dropped by Steve Cooper in November and then dropped again, like brought back into the side <laughs> by Nuno, then dropped again. Um, so originally, obviously, it dropped for um, Vlaka Demos. Demos and then dropped again for, for Sells, who has, has looked quite good since February. But yeah, like Henderson, Navas, and Hennessy were their keepers last year. Obviously, Henderson and Navas splitting most of the minutes. Um, and then Bree Samba, you know, was the goalkeeper who got them into the Premier League. Now one of the highest performing keepers in all of Europe at Lens. Like his, started you know, go, for France. He started for France. He's going to go to the Euros. May well be a European champion, champion by by the end of the summer. Um, you know, like it's just how on earth are you supposed to how on earth are you supposed to sustain yourself in the Premier League if you can't even have a goalkeeper have mm. a, have a number one for more than a season long, and even then have like. You know, like we talk, you know, there was a lot of talk about Arteta and Raya and Ramsdale at the start of the season. Like, this is like, this is that on steroids. Mm. Like, three different goalkeepers, you know, throughout throughout the year, like, and with a, you know, with a back line that's also been chopped and changed a bit just because of the, the huge amount of, you know, personnel in that side and, and injuries, etc. Like, if you can't have continuity in your back line like that, then... You just don't have a hope, I'm afraid. Like yeah. I just, I think if if Forest don't, if Forest carry, well, they they can't carry on necessarily because of PSR. But uh, like if, if Forest don't go, go down this year, then I, I think they're absolute shoo to go down next year. Like, I really do think that if if they're go, if they're not going to change their strategy in any way, like if they're going to carry on with this kind of lack of continuity, um, and that, I think Matt, Matt Turner's at like a, one of the main you know symptoms of that, I guess. Yeah, no, I, t- I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm glad someone else is saying it because I've had some battles with Nottingham Forest fans recently on Twitter and or X or whatever. And they, they a lot of them, I mean, Twitter is not the, the best sort of representation of what fan no. bases really think. But a lot of them can't really see that their business has been pretty mental in the last yeah. two years. And they're like, we had to do it. I get that you had to do it in the first year you came up, but... Did, do you, your, did, do you, your, did you though? Well, they, like, did, they, they had well, a lot of players on loan and a lot of their they, best they players were on loan. But Burnley yeah. had it last year and they didn't go out and sign so many players. And They know, are going down this year. To they be fair. are <laughs> probably going down this year. But it does feel like Forrest might have given themselves financial issues that could like haunt them for a decade. Mm. And, you know, they're like, oh, we had to do it. You don't have to go sign out to. that many goalkeepers in the first two years up. You know, just get it right. Back your recruitment the first time yeah. and give them more of a chance if it's not performing or... You know, they have changed, chopped and changed their heads of recruitment. Just over 40 players signed in two years. Like yeah. That lack of continuity, it hasn't helped Chelsea. It hasn't helped Forrest. I don't think it's any coincidence that both mm. have had really quite embarrassing seasons so far. Yes, yeah, and it's not about the money spent. Like, yes, like some, you know, it is, you do have to, you do have, to, like, generally speaking, you do have to be a bit unsustainable to, like, get up to the Premier League and then stay there, at least to begin with, unless you're, like, a Brentford or a Brighton who have managed to do it, you know, ha- managed to do it fairly sustainably. Um, Bournemouth too, fairly. Bo- Bo- Bournemouth as well to an extent, although they did, you know, They've they, they, they have more, spent yeah. a, a fair amount. But it's, yeah, it's it's the actual, it's just the sheer quantity of players. Mm. It's like, sp- yeah, sure, spend 100 million. Often, you know, we saw that with Fulham back in the day. Like, often it doesn't work. But sure, spe- spend spend a lot of money, but like, spend it on a starting 11. Don't spend it on like, yeah, however many players they, they've done. And, and certainly, you know, certainly do it with, with the idea of there being, you know, certain players that are going to be the starters, like, without a doubt you know like uh, and you know it's, it's just yeah it's unfair on the manager you know it was unfair on Steve Cooper for, for him to have to deal with a squad that of, of that size um, and yeah like I think it's yeah it's just symptomatic of, of where Forrest are right now I think Ibrahim Songre was my other shout at 30 million like hasn't, nice. hasn't just hasn't been good enough his, his drop off has really been quite all insane. across like, in every metric as well yeah is, 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 like anything he was good at at PSV, he's not doing it. At yeah, all like in a, in, a, in a you know a PSV side that used to dominate the ball, he used to make six tackles and interceptions a game. Now he's you know on around four for a, for a not uh, for a counter attack. And his dribbling has completely fallen off. Yeah, that's fallen off. His passing's fallen off. Um, it looks but, a bit disinterested. As well. But yeah, so that's that's that would be my other shout. But I think yeah, I'm tempted. I think I'm tempted to go with Matt yeah. Turner just because of how you. Know, how much it sums up for the club. Yeah. yeah, let's go with Matt Turner. Nice one, Belinda. Right, uh, let's move on to Burnley. 
just a really terrible season, isn't it? I thought mm. about James Trafford. I feel like he's taken a lot of flack in the last few months. Yeah. People have woken up to the fact he found the Premier League pretty difficult. They replaced him with Murich before the international break, and that led to a slight upturn in the results. But I'm actually going for Zeki Amdouni. Mm. Um, it was super expensive. 18.6 million euro move from FC Basel. He'd been on loan at Basel last year. They signed him from Lusain last summer, then instantly sold him on to Burnley for a huge profit. One on FC Basel. That's how to... <laughs> to really dominate a British uh, club, I should say. Um, but yeah, it was excellent for Basel last year. 22 goals in 53 games. That was really, really exciting. Got a couple in the Europa League as well. But this year, he ranked six for minutes played, but his output has just been really quite miserable, to be honest. Four goals. I think that's level with uh, Lyle Foster um, at the top of the Burnley scoring charts as well. You look at someone like Jay Rodriguez has played far, few far fewer minutes, but his expected goals per 90 ratio is almost double that of Amdouni. I feel like maybe Vincent Company slightly backed the wrong horse with his striking options this year. A lot of that is also due, due to the fact that Lyle Foster had to that, take that break due to his mental health and wish him all the best with his recovery. But Amdouni has just not looked the part. And mm. David Datro Fafana as well is now al already level with him for Premier League goals. And he's only been there since January. So yeah, that was a disappointing signing. To be honest, you could pick out a number of players mm. in that Burnley side. I, I, I thought there were so many choices. I mean, who did you go for, Mikey? Uh, I went for uh, Jakob Brun Larsson. Mm. Um, only seven starts this season. Three of those have come since March. Um, even then, he was hooked at half time when they were 2 0 up against West Ham. Um, again, like, you know, Brownhill brought on, I think, probably to, to protect that scoreline a bit, but. You know they end up there. Yeah, they end up drawing that game, and again, I think you know is that I think that's probably naive from from company that decision. But nevertheless, you know he came into this side as a fairly experienced player at 25 years old. You know it's a young Burnley side, and he was really highly rated. But he came through at Dortmund um, way back in you know 2017, 2018. Um, but he hasn't made 10 more than 10 league appearances. Uh, no, sorry, he's not made more than 10 league starts since the 18-19 season. Of course, he's been at Hoffenheim since then. But, yeah, I just think, given given his experience uh, and given how highly rated he is, I, I just expected a bit more from him uh, in, in this Burnley team, you know, an attacking Burnley side. But he struggled to get into the team. You know, Odebear and Kolyosho were, were very much ahead of him in the pecking order. Odebear's now been moved into a front two with Fofana, so that's allowed him in, obviously, Kolyosho's injury. Um, so he is getting the game time now, but yeah, I just expected I expected to see a lot more from Larson. Maybe it's a bit harsh because he hasn't played that much football, but I would have expected him to have impressed I mean, the company that, more. With that CV, I'm, I don't think yeah. that's crazy. Um, Belinda on the relegation sides, Burnley, Sheffield United. Who do you want to Who do you want to talk about? Yeah, I, to be fair, Sander Burge kind of crosses over a little mm, bit because yeah. I was going to talk about him for Sheffield, but yeah, it just I guess well, I'll go on Sheffield United then. Uh, and talk about him, but like they lost the two key players, right? Sander Burge and Njai. Njai ten days before the start of the season yeah, as well. So they were two big losses to the Sheffield United side, they and they scrambling. replaced them with, I guess, like Archer and Gustavo Hamer. Um, and I, I feel as though it may be a bit harsh to sort of single those two out because obviously this Sheffield United side is getting dubbed as maybe one of the worst Premier League sides we've seen. So rightly so. Yeah, to, to put that on an, any individual. I don't know. It feels a bit feels a bit harsh, but no, no. yeah, Archer's only got four goals this season, but he's also only had like four xG. So like that makes me feel mm. like okay, he's not getting much much help up there. He's not getting much service. Hamer's another one, a bit older. He's twenty six, so he should be more established. I was really looking forward to seeing him kick on like in the Premier League this season mm. when he got the move from Coventry because he had a great like great season last year in the Championship. With so, and I think he he still does look a tidy player, but again, just the system is just all over the place and they didn't replace, they, they're missing those two big players but if you look at the defence as well they if they carry on conceding at the rate they have they're on track to concede 100 goals and wow. they're on track to also have a minus 67 goal difference Derby County in 07 08 had minus 69 goal difference so if they have another thrashing the record is they on could break, yes, they could break yeah. the record for the worst Big goal time. difference so come on Sheffield United <laughs> <no>. <laughs> yeah you could equally pick out anyone <laughs> from the back line yeah. as well uh, and then the last name I was also going to mention for them is Ryan Brewster Mm. And maybe Sheffield United fans probably won't have him as flop because maybe they don't expect anything from him anymore. Yeah. But from the What's outside looking in, of? 20 million this went on him in 2020. Uh, I mean, Frank is even more than 20 million, I think. Um, and that was a great Michael Edwards sale. Yeah. yeah uh, and yeah, I think they've seen him score four or five goals. Uh, I think it's five in the championship. I'd actually forgotten about him. 
Yeah, mm. and he, he's now out for the season again. He's got another injury. Um, that is bad luck, to be fair. So, yeah. For Sheffield United, <laughs> I went one, with uh, Anil Ahmed Khodzic, which felt maybe a little harsh. I think you could go for anyone from that entire squad. But I remember watching him in the Championship last year, particularly against Sunderland. I thought he was looked like a really exciting player. Um, he's obviously absolutely massive, but in terms of his ability on the ball, he, he ranks in pretty much the bottom, I think it's the bottom 6% of centre-backs in Europe for like passes, pass completion, progressive passes. He's not a bad reader of the game. He's obviously massive, good in the air, but just sort of sums up Bur uh, Burnley. Sheffield United just not quite being at the level required to even really compete in the Premier League. It's, it's been pretty miserable. Yeah, um, I, I did have Archer down, um, although it does feel quite harsh. He's 22 as well. He's, he, he's really young. It's just his, his, numbers, his number drop-off from Borough last year is so mm. big, and it's not just the goals, it's, you know, his... You know his his involvement in build up, his ability to provide chances as well yeah. has really dropped off. You know he was a bit of a provider at Borough last year, just a really good all round attacker. Um, but again, you're stepping up from the Championship to the Premier League. You're stepping up. You're doing that playing for clearly the worst team in the Premier League as well. So it, it, it's really really harsh on him, I think. Um, but having said that, I just think as well, it's not necessarily just for the club. It's for the player as well. Like. To, to leave Aston Villa and and join this Sheffield United side on a permanent, it's like, mm. you know, like I just think you know another loan in the Championship this season with with a with a you know a decent you know middling to to top club in the Championship, which he's more than good enough for, and his stock rises again, and maybe he gets a move to a bigger club. Mm. Now it's like, okay, he'll go down to the Championship with Sheffield United. And maybe Sheffield United will challenge again in the championship. You know, yeah, like you say, like Hamer, great at Coventry last year. Like, there's nothing to say Sheffield United can't, but it's just like, you know, his stock does drop there and he doesn't want to be at Sheffield United his whole career. Like, it just feels like there's a, maybe, that's, that, maybe, that, maybe that's two years of, of mm. Archer's development, which has been hampered a little bit by going to a club that's, a that's, that's on, a, on a bit of a downfall. And you talk about you know goals that Sheffield United could concede before the end of the season. They go to Liverpool on the 4th of April. Um, they will have played Fulham by the time we're watching this, I believe. Um, but then they have Chelsea at home and then they also have to go to Old Trafford. They also have to go to St. James's Park. They go to Everton on the second last day of the season. Like, that's not going to be easy. Like, uh, like, I think they could. Like, they have Spurs at home on the last day of the season. They may well still be going for top four. Like, they could take some absolute batterings before the end of the year. He does seem to have, like, completely rolled the dice and started playing the kids, really. Um, yeah. Looking for the future, which is maybe the, the right thing to do. But what a miserable campaign for Sheffield United. And what a sad note to finish this episode on. But it has <laughs> been a fun episode, albeit a little sort of moody in I don't tone know. yeah I don't know that has been fun it's fair. I, think, I, think, I think my mood's been low, low. I've just been yeah there's a lot of players that potentially haven't played a lot of, players, a lot of disappointing well players lots of, of players who've been hampered by injuries like, next yeah, week we'll horrible. do something positive we'll do something uplifting but yeah this was a you know a good time to take stock of what we've seen so far this season massive thank you as ever to Mikey but of course the real star of the show Belinda <laughs> once again stepping in <laughs> on Sunday Vibes an absolute pleasure as ever good luck this weekend thank you, thank you. hope you get the results you want to mm. um, that makes it sound like I'm a Liverpool fan. I'm yeah. just enjoying the title race. <laughs> yeah. I hope kind of everyone wins this weekend, which is obviously not possible. Uh, guys, thank you so much for watching. We will catch you next week. Bye-bye.